And I'll be seated too. We I shall all be comfortable. So first of all, I really want to thank Jeff for giving me the opportunity to preach this Easter Sunday morning, which is something I haven't done in a long, long time, at least not past about 6 o'clock in the morning. And I'm told that the sun rose without my assistance today. (laughs) Amazing, amazing. I'm especially grateful since this is my last Sunday with you all in person for a couple of months since I am finally having this left knee replaced on Tuesday. Thank you. It's it's good to have a cheerleading section. Um, So think of me over the next few weeks and pray that I will be diligent with my physiotherapy so I can come back stronger than ever. Um, But before I go, I have a few things to say. What a, what a surprise. <laughs> you know, it, it occurs to me that Jesus has always been a little hard to get a hold of. Uh, it's always been kind of hard for people of all times and all places to get a grip on him. And Mary Magdalene was not the first or the last to have this problem. Jesus was always hard to get a hold of. He probably tried to climb out of the manger when he was a baby, so it probably shouldn't surprise us that the grave couldn't hold him either. Even death couldn't keep him down. We don't know much about Jesus' childhood, but we do know that when Jesus was about 12 years old and he visited the temple in Jerusalem with his parents, he slipped through their fingers and they had to go hunting for him for two days. And then when you expect him to be in the temple, he might just as surely be out in the desert praying or up on a hillside preaching or teaching or feeding people or hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors and sinners on the wrong side of town. And it was always hard to figure out where he might turn up next. And all Easter does is make it that way for all eternity. Christ is really on the loose now, and there is no pinning him down, no getting a handle on him, no holding him back. It's like a firefly on a warm summer night. We used to have them in in southern Illinois, where I used to spend my summers as a kid, and my cousins and I used to catch them on summer evenings. We called them lightning bugs. They're harmless little things that that sort of blink in the dark night air. It's, It's actually a mating ritual. But what did we do? We caught them in our grubby little hands and stuffed them in a mason jar. We just couldn't let them alone. Couldn't just watch for where they'd light up next and enjoy them. No, we had to grab them and imprison them in one of Grandma's canning jars. And what did we gain by capturing a firefly? Dead fireflies. It took me a long time to realize that they wouldn't do me any good as long as I tried to control them and hold on to them. There might be a sermon in that. <laughs> I had this beautifully illustrated for me once upon a time. I was, I was in a relationship with this woman, and she broke up with me. She dumped me hard, and I was pretty bummed at the time. <clears throat> and in retrospect, I feel kind of sorry for her because her family, instead of being supportive of her, was really ticked at her because they really liked me and for some reason they thought I was a good catch. As I say, in retrospect, I feel badly about that, but at the time I was kind of gloating because I got this nice, loving, supportive card from her mother. She didn't get a card, mind you, but I did. And her mother was this wonderful, funny, loving woman who made the best crab cakes in the world. I miss those. And when we broke up, I think I missed her more than my partner. Anyhow, she sent me this card, and it had a butterfly on it. And on the front it said, if you love something, you have to let it go. If it comes back to you, it's yours. If it doesn't, And then you opened up the card, and inside she had written, hunt it down and slap it silly. (laughs) But truly, truly, you can't control things, and you especially can't control people. You can't hold on to them, because, you know, it's the same way with Jesus. Look what happens at the tomb on Easter morn. 
Mary has come to pay her respects to her beloved Jesus, to bring her grief. She's brought burial spices and her own fragrant loving heart. And she loved him to death all through his life, and now she'll love him in death after life. Because love doesn't end at the grave. Can I get an amen? amen? Love is stronger than death. And if there's one thing I want you to remember from this sermon, it's this. Love is stronger than death. Love never ends. But when Mary arrives, something's happened, something weird. The stones rolled away, and there are angels sitting by the open tomb, and that's weird. She doesn't know them as angels. They've taken the form of human beings who tell her good news. But the news is weird, too, and she still doesn't get it. So she turns to ask the gardener where they've taken Jesus' earthly remains. At least, she thinks it's the gardener. And he says, Mary, Mary, calling her by name. And she answers, Rabboni. And Rabboni is an old, seldom used title, title meaning teacher. And it might have been her affectionate pet name for him. Maybe it was playful, like calling him preacher boy. Like I've never called Jeff that. <laughs> <laughs> the look. We don't know. But we know that next she throws her arms around his neck and hugs him tightly as if to say, I don't know if I'm awake or dreaming. I don't know if this is real or all in my mind. But either way, I have finally got you right where I want you and I am not letting you go this time. You know, maybe the whole time she'd known him, Mary may have wanted to hold on to Jesus like that. Maybe once in a while she got to linger in a hug because he let her. Maybe they even danced together, but the powers that be would cut in. And they stole him from her and from the rest of the world, and she couldn't protect him. And they hung him on a cross, and they stuffed him in a grave. And if the grave couldn't hold Jesus, then nothing could. And that should be great news for Mary. But then he tells her she can't hold on to him. Now, if I were Jesus, and once again, I think I speak for all of us when I say, thank God I'm not, I think I might have done what Mary wanted, whatever Mary wanted. You know, there he is. He's had a rough few days. He's been arrested and beaten and murdered, literally sent to hell and back, and he's finally held in the arms of love and not nailed down by the hands of hate. Why on earth would he want to push her away? But he wants to love and be loved by Mary, by every Mary, for the rest of eternity, and not just for a fleeting few moments more here on earth. So he says, gently I think, don't hold me. So what's at stake here for us in Jesus telling Mary not to hold him the way she wanted? something fundamental, something so important we really can't understand Easter unless we get this. Because every time we think we have a hold of Jesus, he won't stay long because he has other places to go, places he wants to take us, people he wants us to meet. And Jesus is free of the grave and roaming at large in the world now and he won't be confined again. He is on the loose and we have to track him like a firefly and watch for his flickering light appearing here and there and everywhere in the world. But he's not just running away from us. He's not avoiding intimacy, afraid of commitment. He is on the loose in order to loose us from every grave we find ourselves in. He wants us to live faces forward without fear and it is the business of the resurrected Christ to call us out of the false securities that can become graves for us. Christ is on the loose here in this world. Christ is on the loose here in MCC Toronto, and this is what we need to remember. We are not here for a history lesson. 
or a physics lesson or a science lesson on what exactly happened on that first morning at the tomb. We won't believe in the resurrection of Jesus any more than Mary would have unless the same thing happens to us as happened to her. Because Christ is free from the grave, he's free to free us from our graves, to meet us unexpectedly along the ordinary paths of our lives, and fear and hate and despair are graves that Christ wants to free us from. And Christ has been working on this for a long time. On that first Easter morning, the disciples, the men anyway, the disciples were all huddled up in fear after the crucifixion. And even Mary Magdalene must have had to screw up her courage to go to the tomb that morning. But this is where Easter has to become personal for each of us. If Christ is going to free us from the graves of fear and hate and despair, we have to let go of it ourselves. And if we're intent on holding on, there's no way that Christ can lead us into a future of hope. And I have to admit, sometimes I really struggle with this. I have always said that the worst thing about preaching is the way that what you say inevitably, inevitably, comes back to bite you on the butt. Sometimes sooner, sometimes later, sometimes years later, but inevitably. And I fully expect to turn around someday and find this sermon firmly attached to my rear end. Feel free to point it out when that happens. But here's how it works. When I was a lawyer and living in Washington, D.C., before I discovered MCC, I was a member of the National Presbyterian Church. And I went there, frankly, because they had the best preachers in town. I remember the, the late Louis Evans preached some of the best sermons I've ever heard. And for a time, the preacher there was a guy named Craig Barnes. And he told about one time when he was talking with a couple who were about to get married, and they were deeply, deeply in love, and the wedding plans were coming together beautifully, and then all of a sudden the groom-to-be blurts out, I just have to say I am terrified of this. And his fiance got this horrified look on her face and he tried to explain that what he was afraid of was not marrying her, but the possibility of losing her. He said, when my mother died, the grief was just overwhelming and I love you even more. I just don't know how I could ever survive if anything ever happened to you. Well, Dr. Barnes had an answer for him. He wisely reminded him that 100% of all marriages come to an end, some prematurely through divorce or an early death, but all eventually one way or another. Your best case scenario, he said, your absolute best case scenario is that they would grow more and more in love over the course of their lifetime together and then it would hurt even more when the end comes. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. <laughs> and I gotta tell you, he's right. Like Mary Magdalene on that first Easter morning, I know from painful experience of loss, and I know that all of you do too. But here's his point and mine. We can either go through life fearing that any day we may lose what and who we love, in which case we will not be living at all. We will be slowly dying. Or we can die to the notion that we'll be able to control life, to hold on to who and what we love forever, in which case we're free to seize the day and embrace that love as a gift from the one who is the author of life and love. We cannot control life any more than we can con control the divine force of God that is at work in this world. We cannot put God in a box. Because God is on the loose. 
freeing us from fear and hate and despair and calling us to live resurrected lives, calling us to hope and not fear every day of our lives. And there's no telling what she's up to next. Amen.